Welcome to the New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for February 17, 2023. This is an extra special uh, meeting because uh, we have Dan Taylor on. Dan in um, September of 2000 was one of our first uh, guest speakers when we got Zoom. Uh, unfortunately, I did not know what I was doing, so we did not record that event. Uh, however, uh, Dan is such a great speaker and his book is so important that I thought it was um, important to uh, do a uh, remake. So this is going to be uh, version two of our meeting. The only difference is we do not have uh, our regular uh, group of people in here, which usually is about 30 guys in here. So uh, they will not be here to uh, ask questions. I'll ask a few, and the meeting will not be as long as our usual ones. There'll be no extra innings today. Um, but uh, it is going to be Dan talking about his book. And then uh, I'll ask a few questions, but Dan will probably answer most of the questions in his talk. Uh, the book that Dan wrote is called The Scouts Report, My 70 Years in Baseball. Uh, talks about George Genovese, who was a tremendous baseball scout. And uh, before we get started, Dan, thank you so much for taking the time and doing this special rebroadcast. Uh, this book's still available, of course, as is all of your great books. What's the best way to go about getting this? Well, Amazon is probably your best bet, barnesandnoble.com. And, and the publisher is McFarland and Company out of North Carolina. And you can always go on their website and order it directly from them. And as many of you uh, could tell already, Dan's got a great voice, but <laughs> he's also just a tremendous writer. His, his voice uh, penetrates into his writing. So, Dan, why don't you tell us about George Genovese? Gary, Gen thanks. Sorry. I appreciate the opportunity. So uh, what makes George Genovese so unique? What makes him a legend? He is considered the titan of the scouting industry. Uh, really an iconic guy uh, as a baseball, longtime baseball scout. Uh, and you look at the players that he signed, George Foster, Jack Clark, Gary Maddox, Gary Matthews. And what really astounds a lot of people in the profession is that these guys who became big league stars, all stars, um, really weren't as amateur players. George Foster did not play at all his senior year of high school. Uh, Gary Maddox uh, in, in Colt League was playing second base and nobody thought much of him. Uh, Jack Clark and Gary Matthews were, were both pitchers and not very good ones in high school. And uh, what always astounded other scouts, in fact, they, the stories were legendary of, of Al Campanis raging at his scouts you know, with the Dodgers. How did Genovese find these guys? What's the matter with you guys? Uh, George had an uncanny ability, as I've said to people who agree with me, uh, to project the unprojectable. And, and projecting is one of the most unique and important facets of, of being a baseball scout. And, and that's looking at a 17 or 16 year old and trying to project what their body will be when they're say 22, 23, 24, and, and what that change in their body might bring to their skills. And uh, here George is projecting guys that really weren't playing or playing very well and he's projecting them as future major league players. Where did that come from? Well, George is an interesting guy, grew up in Staten Island. Uh, his parents were immigrants from Italy. And every one of his brothers uh, played professional baseball, as did he. Um, most of them, just minor league ball. One went to spring training with Cleveland, but uh, got homesick and, and quit. Um, but George ultimately got to the big leagues with the Washington Senators in 1950. Um, he was signed as a scout out of a tryout camp in Connecticut and you know, rose the, through the ranks in the Cardinals organization. Uh, he served in the Pacific Theater in World War II, came home, and ultimately in 1940, he reached uh, the Pacific Coast League, which at that time was the highest level of minor league ball, uh, played for the Hollywood Stars, and then uh, was drafted in the Rule 5 draft along with his Hollywood teammate Irv Noren, and they both went to the Washington Senators. Uh, in 51, George came back to Hollywood. And actually, the reason he was love sick, he was homesick. He, uh, he uh, was engaged to a woman, uh, uh, an aspiring actress and model in Southern California, and uh, wanted to come back to Southern California. And so he rejoined the Hollywood stars 
1951. And, and, and that really turned into, uh, I mean, he, he bemoaned that forever saying, you know, I never should have done that. I mean, he did end up marrying the woman, but uh, he said, you know, if that hadn't happened, I'd have been in the big leagues a few years. Um, but by going back to Hollywood, it ended up connecting him with a guy who would change his life. And that was Branch Rickey. Uh, because when he went back to Hollywood, uh, the Hollywood stars at that point uh, connected with the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, as a farm team. And following the 51 season, uh, the Pirates purchased George's contract. He had hoped it might take him back to the big leagues. It did not. And in spring training, Branch Rickey called him in and said, George, you've lost a step. You're not going to get back to the big leagues, but I see a big future in, 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 for you. And that's as a manager. And they had just secured a uh, affiliation with a, a team in Batavia, New York, uh, in the New York Penn League. I think it was called the Pony League back then. Pennsylvania, Ontario, New York League. And so George went to uh, Batavia as the player manager and thus began a 10-year minor league managing career. And ultimately, uh, when Branch Rickey uh, was let go by the Pirates, uh, George had managed their uh, AA farm team in Mexico City for a couple of seasons, uh, became the first uh, American manager in the Mexican League and, and won the pennant his first year down there. Uh, but Branch Rickey uh, was kind of squeezed out by the pirate ownership there in, in the late 50s, mid to late 50s, and ownership started cutting back on the farm system, and, and managers were let go. So George was let go after the 1959 season. And uh, his older brother, Chick, was uh, a scout and manager in the Giants organization, and, and he went to Jack Schwarz, the, the head of the farm system, and, and really lobbied hard for his brother. The Giants had a nepotism rule in place, and they uh, Jack Schwarz waived it and hired George to manage. Uh, all they had was a, a spot with a low-level club. But this would begin a, a more than 30-year association between George Genovese and the Giants. Uh, he ultimately uh, became the manager in 62 and 63 of their AA farm team in El Paso, Texas, an ex a very prolific club. And once he came into the organization, he saw problems and, and he saved several players who the Giants were going to release, minor league players, uh, Jesus Salou, uh, Minervino Rojas. Uh, there were several players that in spring training, other managers really didn't care for, uh, advocated their release. And George said, no, uh, I want to take them with me. And uh, he ultimately helped to, to shape them into, into standout players. Uh, in 1963, George was managing winter ball in Venezuela and uh, had a really good club down there. And one evening he gets notified by the front desk of his hotel that he has a, a phone call coming in from San Francisco. And George turned to his wife, June, and said, this is it. I'm the new manager of the San Francisco Giants. And he runs downstairs to take the call. And the message is exactly the opposite of what George was expecting. It was Jack Schwartz telling him, uh, that he was not going to manage anymore, that Schwarz was fed up with not getting any players out of Southern California, which he considered to be the most fertile baseball area in America, and that he felt George, based on his evaluations over his, his time in the Giant organization, was the guy who had a unique eye for talent, and that scouting was going to be George's future. And George was upset and ultimately uh, agreed to do it for one year and said that if he didn't like it, he was going to leave and look for a managing opportunity elsewhere. But Jack Schwartz says something very profound and very true, ironically. He said, George, if you do what I think you can do, you'll be scouting as long as you can see to drive a car. And, he, and it was really true. Uh, George was scouting right up pretty much till the time he passed away at the age of 93. Uh, right off the bat, George came up with a, a unique idea. And it, it really actually came from one of his neighbors. They were talking about his new role over uh, a discussion on the, at the kitchen table. And uh, the idea came up to create a semi-pro team. And semi-pro baseball in Southern California in the early 60s, well, really through the 30s, 40s, 50s, into the early 60s, it was huge. I mean, companies spent a lot of money to sponsor teams. They would pay uh, professional players to work in the off season uh, just so they could get them on their teams. And uh, they filled the parks uh, with, with fans. It was a big thing in Southern California. And George thought, I'm going to create a team and I'm going to use it as, as an incubator. 
We're going to get these kids in here. We're going to get them playing. We're going to watch them and evaluate them. And, and from that, figure out who we're going to sign. And he told Jack Schwartz uh, of his plan. And Jack kind of brushed it off, said, yeah, 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 whatever. Do, do what you think you need to do. And George said, well, I need some support. I need bats and balls and I need some uniforms. And Jack said, just go to go to Casa Grande, uh, raid the equipment room at, at spring training, get what you need. George said one of the things that was really important to him was to get as many Willie Mays and Willie McCovey jerseys as possible because he thought these high school kids might be enamored wearing that jersey and it would be a recruiting tool for him. So he created this team, put it in the Southern California Semi-Pro League. They played Sunday afternoons. And that first year, he had some pretty impressive talent on his team. One young player was driving over 100 miles every Sunday from Riverside to play on the team, and that was Bobby Bonds. And when June came up, there was no draft yet in baseball. It was still wide open signing, and you could not sign a player until 30 minutes after the conclusion of their high school graduation ceremony. So George's first June, he ran down to San Diego, and the first player he signed was Ken Henderson. Uh, he then went over to Arizona to sign a pitcher by the name of Tom Jones. And then uh, he instructed uh, the Giants that he wanted to sign Bobby Bonds. They sent Tom Sheehan down to have a look at him. Sheehan didn't like him, called Jack Schwartz, said, George is crazy. Don't touch this guy. George lobbied for a couple of more, more months to sign Bonds before Jack Schwartz finally relented. And, of course, the rest is history. The following year, the draft came in, and things changed a lot. Uh, but George had amazing success over the years. Uh, with his draft picks, uh, his first first rounder uh, was Gary Matthews. And uh, one of the things that, that George always had in the back of his mind, a lot of scouts, especially in Southern California with so many schools uh, and a lot of territory to cover, scouts would come in and see maybe the first couple of innings of a game. And then they'd leave to go catch another game and try to catch an inning or two of that game. George wasn't like that. George said the, the most important thing to see happens in the latter innings. And uh, and he got a few players this way, but uh, one, two very interesting cases. Uh, the first was Gary Matthews. Uh, he went to an American Legion game and Matthews was pitching and he was terrible. And all the scouts got up and left after the first inning and George stayed. And then uh, Matthews was moved to another position and uh, had a phenomenal game, had a home run, had a triple uh, was put in the outfield, threw a runner out at the plate, and George said, I saw all I needed to see. I saw a good bat, I saw power, I saw speed, and I saw a tremendous throwing arm. And Gary Matthews became first-round draft pick and a rookie of the year. Similarly, Jack Clark, a number of years later. Uh, Jack was a guy that was pitching. Uh, George and a number, was among a number of scouts who saw him play, and he got lit up in the first inning and taken out of the game. And as soon as he was taken out, well, he wasn't taken out of the game, I should say. He was taken off the mound and put at third base. And as soon as he was taken off the mound, a lot of these other scouts, all the other scouts actually got up and left. Uh, George stayed and saw Jack Clark hit two tape measure home runs later in the game and ultimately drafted Jack Clark uh, off of that particular day. Were there, did George have frustrations? Were there guys that, that he... Uh, Lost out on, uh, he, he tells the story. I asked him about Gary Carter, for instance, a Hall of Famer. And George laughed and said, you know, every time I, he said, I knew him. I had signed his older brother, Gordy, who played in the Giant organization, an outfielder. Um, and when he went to sign Gordy, Gary was a young kid and was saying, I hope you're coming back to sign me. And, and so he, he knew the family well. But when he went to watch Gary, he said it seemed like every other pitch, Gary was having to run to the backstop to pick up the baseball. He just wasn't a very good catcher. And George said, looking at who we had in the organization and other pitch positions, I just didn't see a place for Gary uh, playing first base or the outfield or third base. So he passed on him. But I think the one there were two huge frustrations for him. Uh, one was Eddie Murray. Uh, George uh, knew the family. He had signed uh, one of Eddie's older brothers. And Eddie uh, was playing catcher at Locke High School in Los Angeles, a team that had Ozzie Smith at shortstop, Daryl Jackson, who later pitched in the big leagues, was one of their star pitchers, and Rich Murray, who the Giants uh, drafted and signed, was the first baseman on this team. Well, George, he never saw anybody at a Locke High School game. 
So he felt that that he really had exclusive on uh, his evaluation of Eddie Murray, and and he was lobbying for Eddie Murray to be a first round guy. They brought Carl Hubble down to to double check and cross check, uh, which they did with what they call premium picks. And there was a, a mailman that day happened to get off work early to come out to see the game, and this mailman noticed Carl Hubble with George, and he knew what that meant because the mailman happened to be the bird dog in that area for Ray Poitavent, who was the scout for the Baltimore Orioles. So this guy runs home, gets on the phone, and immediately calls Ray Poitavent and tells him, Hubble's with George, and they're looking at Eddie Murray. So the Orioles scouting director shared with me that he gets the call from Poitavent, and he, Don Prees, Ducky Prees, told me the story that he immediately, he knew that Poitavin had probably not seen Murray and there was a problem. And he told Poitavin, I'm sent, I said, I'm coming out and we're going to drive Southern California and we're going to take your top five evaluations and we're going to re-rank them. And they did. And uh, they, they were very impressed with Murray. And I believe off the top of my head, I think Murray ended up going in the third round and that's where they, of the five, that's where they placed Murray. They had Rich Dower, Mike Parrott. There were a couple of others. There was an outfielder who was badly injured in a car crash that they had highly ranked. Anyway, um, so in the Giants' case, many of their scouts would get their feathers ruffled every June when George was getting a lot of his recommendations selected in the draft, and they were not. And so uh, Gene Thompson happened to come out from the Midwest this particular year because he was insistent that a pitcher he really liked should be taken high. A left-hander by the name of Jeff Little. So Jack Schwartz and Carl Hubble are kind of in this predicament because George is telling them we got to take Murray, tremendous power, great skills. And he's got Gene Thompson, who's so committed to Jeff Little that he has flown from the Midwest to San Francisco to sit in the draft room to lobby for this kid. So as the draft goes, uh, Hubble turns to Schwartz and said, listen, back when George recommended Gary Matthews, we made him our number one pick. And in hindsight, nobody knew about him. We probably could have gotten him with a second or third round pick and gotten a couple of other premium players. So they decided that's what they were going to do in the case of Eddie Murray. Fatal mistake. Because the third, whatever the third or fourth round comes around and a couple of picks before the Giants, they're stunned to hear the Baltimore Orioles select Eddie Murray. And the Giants lost out. Uh, another instance, uh, George was lobbying for Mark McGuire. He did fall in the draft that year. George knew what it was going to take to sign him, what other which other teams did not know and caused some concern. Um, so that that was a huge uh, uh, disappointment for George losing out on Mark McGuire. Uh, and did, did did George Genovese? You said he passed. You know that the Giants pass on a few guys he recommended. Was there one player? that he got the Giants to take who he wound up regretting that turned out to be a, a real bust? Uh, you know, there were a couple that actually the, the Giants were puzzled and George felt that they didn't stick with them long enough. They're, they had a first round pick named Terry Lee from San Luis Obispo, California. I believe his nephew was a first round pick this past June. Um, and Lee was quickly released after one year in the organization and, and other guys told me that when they saw him, they couldn't understand what George was thinking. And George felt they needed to, to stay with him, that he had power and, and that branch Ricky's lesson had always been that the power power is the last tool to kick in. Um, so, you know, Clark was taken fairly low Maddox and Foster, they were Jan uh, January drafts. And that was a situation where, you know, George liked to get him into a junior college and play a little bit before going to spring training um these names that you're you know any giant fan gary maddox gary matthews you mentioned ken henderson and i told you nobody wore eye black like ken henderson <laughs> in, in my book but uh that fabulous names and, and again any any real fan of the giants especially in the uh 70s these are the big time players that they uh, well you look at those outfielders they had this great pipeline rob deer and of course, George was responsible on Matt Williams and, and Dave Kingman. Um, and there were some pitchers in there as well along the way. I mean, John DeQuisto and 
so yeah, he he had just the, the the one though that really frustrated him at the end, and it was not with the Giants. It was at the end when he was with the Dodgers. Uh, he saw he was tipped off by a player that he had once signed for the Giants to a young high school outfielder, and George went to see him play. Nobody was there. He felt nobody knew about him. And when he took him up with the Dodgers, the Dodgers just brushed George off. And, and that was Giancarlo Stanton. And, uh, and George uh, thought the world of him and, and was really angry that the Dodgers wouldn't listen to him and the players that they chose instead never made it. So, yeah, his, his skills were really remarkable. And the things he did for the giant organization are so just when, when When did his tenure end with the Giants and did it end in a bad manner? It did. Uh, uh, the new ownership group came in. Uh, Brian Sabian was made the scouting director. Uh, he wanted to bring a lot of his own people in. Uh, he uh, largely ignored George's uh, recommendations. Uh, came down and uh, watched a couple of players with George uh, in Southern California. Uh, and it, it, ultimately, uh, he just he wanted to bring his own people in and, and weed out the the people he had inherited, and he let George go. Uh, years later, uh, when the uh, Professional Baseball Scouts Foundation was formed, they named their Lifetime Achievement Award the George Genovese Award. And, of course, George was the first uh, first recipient, and Bob Quinn and Peter McGowan came in uh, for the ceremony at a dinner in, in Beverly Hills, and they both pulled George aside and apologized to him. And Bob Quinn said, had we realized what Brian was doing, we would have stopped it. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it did, did leave a lot of uh, bad taste in George's mouth toward the Giants. Did the bad taste uh, lead to the uh, cover of your book? No, not, no. Not wearing a giant. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. Uh, okay. I know I was, I was with George when that picture was taken. Uh, before a Dodger game one night, uh, it was, uh, and I, I don't know how the publisher ended up grabbing that picture to use. So uh, the other picture of George in spring training, his first spring training with the Pirates, training with the New Orleans Pelicans, was one that uh, George allowed me to use in the book. Uh, but no, his picture with the Dodgers, I, uh, I was completely uh, caught off guard by that. So when did, um, when did he hang him up? Well, he was still a consultant with the Dodgers uh, uh, up to the time he passed uh, in 2015. And, uh, you know, he he was just kind of looking at some areas close to his home in the San Fernando Valley, uh, looking at some kids there and and uh, passing on recommendations as he saw them uh, and worked right up to the end. So so let me ask something, Dan. Uh, I would think you would be a huge proponent for – George Genovese to be in the Hall of Fame. Without question. And I'm not and, alone. And, I mean, in the in the book, Jack Clark makes the comment that, that he deserves to be in and that Jack better hear about it first because there's going to be a lot of guys that want a front row seat for that and he wants to be there. Um, yeah, you, you talk to people uh, in the profession. There's a, a long, long belief that scouts belong in the Hall of Fame and and many feel that, that George certainly should be the first among them to go in. Well, based on based on his seventy years in baseball and tremendous uh, tenure with the Giants, and then goes to the Dodgers, and there are, there are no scouts in the hall, correct? That is correct. No scouts in the hall, and they name an award after him. I, I, doesn't make sense to me. Well, you know, you wonder because uh, the broadcasters and the writers—that's not technically the hall. They pay for a wing. Their organization pays for a wing, and so their annual Lifetime Achievement Award is recognized at the Hall of Fame. And my thought is that that may be how scouts wind up getting in, is that organization ultimately, uh, in some way, builds a, a, a collaboration with the Hall of Fame. And those who get the George Genovese Award uh, are enshrined at the Hall of Fame. Let, let me ask you just, this might be a ridiculous question. Um, you never couple of movies I've seen. Uh, Clint Eastwood was a scout. I forgot. The yep. guy. Something about the curve. Trouble with the curve. Trouble with the curve. And Moneyball, where the scouts are all, you know, meeting at a desk, um, you know, and then uh, the bean changes everything. But uh, are those, based on your experience talking to them, are those uh, things that really happen? 
Yeah, did yeah. Go Bur- did George Bird dog, or was he basically the center? Well, of- some in- some interesting stories on that. George uh, was in a few movies. Uh, he was in a Twilight Zone called The Mighty Casey. Get uh, out of he here! Was- Where? He was the third base coach. You only see him for about a half a second. Uh, he had just come home from from either playing winter ball or managing in, in winter ball in Mexico, and uh, got a call and and went out there. And he hated the experience. It was an old Wrigley Field in L.A., which was all you know concrete and steel, and it, it, he was freezing the whole time. It was a typical hurry up and wait. Uh, McGarity, and that's only- the manager, McGarity. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and I think they were the Zephyrs, correct? That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, he was also uh, 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 almost the uh, the actor uh, uh, Edward James almost uh, spent time with George preparing for a role that he did in a film on a baseball scout. Nice. Uh, George was invited to be one of the scouts in the money in the, in the movie Moneyball. Uh, Artie Harris was kind of one of the scouts there was George's great friend and he was tasked with gathering some scouts and interesting story most of those scouts that he already gathered were guys who had lost their jobs because of cutbacks over Moneyball and Artie was trying to help them out Uh, he asked George George declined Uh, George told me that uh, you know the the sour taste he had over uh, the whole Twilight Zone he just didn't want to sit around all day but all his daughter was being treated for cancer, which ultimately proved fatal. And I think he was very, very concerned and didn't want to uh, be stuck on a movie set all all day long. So yeah, he he was very much involved in, in these things. And uh, Moneyball was very, very accurate. Um, those scouts were really given latitude to just be scouts and, and do their thing and not follow any script. Um, so yeah, it, it's interesting to see how that all works. Uh, trouble with the curve. Uh, struck me as being kind of similar to George and his daughter Kathy's story. She uh, went with him a lot, as as did uh, one of his nieces, who really grew up in George's home. And so, yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting to see a lot of parallels. That's great. So, Dan, um, I, I guess your wish is uh, one day to be uh, in Cooperstown, sitting next to Jack Clark as they enshrine uh, George Genovese. That would be a wonderful day. Can't wait for that to happen. Hope you're okay. there with us. Here's the book. Dan, best way to get it? Once again, Amazon.com, uh, BarnesandNoble.com, and also the publisher is McFarland and Company, and uh, you can order it through them. Listen, I can't thank you enough for doing this special rebroadcast, um, and I, I did it for the viewers because they have to know about George Genovese, and, and they have to know about you. Thank you very much, Gary. Dan, I appreciate we'll, it. we'll talk soon. I'm just going to shut this off and we could hang for a few minutes. Great.